one, and I do post all of the slides you see up aside from the clicker questions. They'll all be posted. So um, what you learned in topic one is you started to familiarize yourself with the MATLAB environment as well as all the short shortcuts that are available. A um, couple things that I hope that you've learned is that code reads from top to bottom, left to right. So if you define a variable at the bottom of your file but use it at the top of the file, it's not going to allow that. Um, unless that variable somehow got saved into your workspace. But if you cleared out your workspace, you have to write from top to bottom, left to right. Um, the next thing is that all lines of code should be suppressed with this semicolon on the end. So when you're typing out lines of code, you should just start getting in the habit of semicolon every single line and only unsuppressing if there's some reason that you're wanting to look at it. Um, a lot of times you'll unsuppress as you're programming, but once you finish up the code, you should resuppress everything. And the reason is because otherwise there's way too much garbage on the screen that you can't see what you're actually interested in looking at. Um, the equal sign is reserved for definitions. It, um, there is a different symbol that we use for checking equality of something, like a relational statement, like are these two things equal? That's actually a, e a double equal sign. The equal sign is reserved for um, defining, defining variables. And the order that you define things is important. The variable has to go on the left-hand side, and the value you're setting to it has to go on the right-hand side. Okay, so if you ever try to do this, it doesn't like it. It's, there's always going to be an error. Um, <clears throat> when you do want to display something to the screen, unless it's just a quick display that you're using as you're starting to write your code, you want to get into the habit of displaying it in a useful and clean way by using one of the display statements. Um, disp and display are pretty similar, and fprintf has a totally different syntax, and that's some of the stuff that you've kind of uh, learned how to use in this first lab. One nice thing is that as we move forward we're going to start using plotting instead of displaying to the screen which is for most people a much more useful way to see what you're doing. You also learned a little bit about different data types so in the lab you both you you both were dealing with numbers so if you just set a variable to a number, remember that it's going to default use floating point number, and um, that is going to be 64 bits. So it's the most that the most storage that you can have for any number. <coughs> We've also been working with character strings, and remember character strings are just verbatim text. They're just symbols. They have no values associated with them, and they're used to describe information. Mm -hmm. Think think of Display statements under the screen, titles, labeling things, that's what character strings are for. And in your lab, you started to deal with combining these two data types into one display statement. So these are the two formats that I want you to be comfortable with in this class. Um, the first is disk, and the second is fprintf. If you haven't done this yet in the lab, I think almost everyone has, this is how it works. So disk is a function that will print to screen exactly what is displayed inside the parentheses. But if you are trying to display more than one thing, so here I'm trying to display B, which is a character string, A, which is a number, you have to put it into square brackets, which combines those two things into an array, which is what we're talking about today. And then if you're mixing data types, strings, and numbers, then you need to convert one into the other. So I'm converting the number into a string to combine them into a single array. So that's what's happening with the disk function. fprintf is a totally different syntax. You put your string that you want printed first, and if you want to incorporate values that variables hold into that sentence, you add a percentage sign, and then Whatever the first, first variable listed behind the string will go to that spot in the sentence. And everything behind the percentage sign is just formatting. The F means that it's a floating point number or a decimal number. Point 0.2 means show two decimal places. 
In your next lab, you're going to do display statements in scientific notation, and this will be an E instead of an F, so that we're looking at really big numbers that we don't want to display all of. We just want to say it's like a million, one times 10 to the six. Okay, <clears throat> so those that's the review. Any questions? Yeah. So is that new display for the concept? Can we display two values? So we have two percentages. Yep. So it'll go in order. So the first percentage sign grabs the first variable, the second percentage sign displays the second. So if you did the bonus in the lab, that's how you would do that. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused why we would choose one of these as the percentage <laughs> on the display and vice versa. Um so this one is way more flexible. It allows you to customize the way that it's displayed much more. This is a little bit easier, and it uses all the same syntax that titles and labels use in plotting. So I like to show both. Um, you don't have to, you can, you can always do either, but I want you to be familiar with the syntax of both. <coughs> yeah? Just to share, I mean, like, percent uh, 0.2F is a second of the A. Yes. And so, why is it interesting in the quote notation when it has like the quote and then the O? Well, why is it accidentally inside of the quote? Uh, yeah, that's why I find F printf most confusing, but it's just the way that the F printf function is programmed. The syntax is programmed to recognize the percentage symbol as a location where you input a value variable. Where this one makes a little more sense because the variable is outside of the string, and so you can see when you're programming that it's recognized as a variable. Any other questions? Okay, so I have a few tips. I always do tips, just so you know. You can always look back at these, but these are typically the only place that I look to put debugging questions on the exam. They're always in these tips. So um, first tip, is if something weird is happening, clear out your workspace. So for example, it's the hardest bug to find because the, the message is not useful, but it already happened a couple times in lab that um, the bug didn't make sense and it's because you overwrote an existing function. So if I set the variable disp equal to one, I would no longer be able to use the disp function and the, the error would be sort of a weird error that doesn't make sense, something about indexing usually. Um, the second thing, the second really common error that you see is undefined function or variable. Typically, this is that you spelled a variable or a function incorrectly, almost always. So look at what it is calling out and just see that you <coughs> did the misspelling. Um, if you don't see the double errors on your, on your screen, that means that you're stuck in the middle of a command. So you just need to control C to get back. When we start using these input prompts, sometimes you'll have to control C many times because you've been running the code, you've pressed that run button 10 times to try to, to get it to run. So it's like stuck 10 times behind on the run. So you have to control C 10 times. I always control C like five times. Like I've never done it just once. Like I always just like click it a couple times and then um, it's fine. And then the last thing is at the top of every M file, you should be getting into the habit of typing close all, clear all. Make extra sure that you're doing this on quizzes because you could be running your code with active workspace variables that, are, that work on your computer, but when the TA runs it on their computer, they're always going to clear out every time they run a new quiz file. So they might not be seeing the same thing you're seeing, but by typing close all, clear all, you know you're just starting from a, like a, a scratch slate, clean slate every time. Okay? All right. So let's move over to the doc cam to start topic two on arrays. <coughs> All right. So again, I'm going to be writing some notes on the doc cam, and then I'm going to be switching over 
to the um, to using MATLAB for a lot of this. So this topic is very important um, topic for MATLAB because it's really the foundation of how the how the software works. But so far, everything that we've been doing in MATLAB. has been with single numbers. So when you're defining variables, you're just saying a equals 1, m equals 6.5. All the variables are just holding a single value. That is hardly ever what kind of data we're dealing with in engineering. Typically, everything that we do comes um, in big sets of arrays. So now we are going to look at how arrays are dealt with in MATLAB. And we're particularly focusing on how things are stored in arrays, how you can manipulate arrays through basic arithmetic that you're used to, and how you can access values within an array. Now the term array is a general term for um, a vector or a matrix or a tensor or anything that um, has a bunch of single numbers stored in a single variable. So they can be any size and that's why we don't call them vectors because they don't need to be 1D. We don't call them matrices because they don't need to be 2D. They can be any dimension. And um, the definition that, just if you want to grab onto something, is an organized collection of numbers So basically, there's something in common that all the numbers have that requires them to be stored in a single variable. Um, and so let's just talk about a couple of different examples. And keep in mind that MATLAB, remember it stands for Matrix Laboratory, <laughs> and everything in MATLAB was designed to efficiently be able to work with arrays. So every single um, manipulation that's done in MATLAB works better when you use um, array notation. So let's start with just a vector that you are used to. So a velocity vector, for example. Um, and this is a row vector that I have here. And um, if you were to write this in MATLAB, you would use any variable name you want. So, so um, V is OK. And then you would um, open with um, a square bracket facing the right. And you would list all the elements of that vector. And then you would close with <clears throat> the opposite square bracket. So this is an array that has the dimensions 1 by 3. It's a row vector. MATLAB also allows you to se separate values in a row with commas. So you can choose to either just do a space or add commas. I always do spaces because it's one less thing to type, but some people prefer commas because it's more clear that they're different numbers um, when you see the comma there. So this would be a 1D array, this row vector. Um, the other type of row vector that you could write is a column vector. So visually, the column vector would have elements stored in um, rows in a single column. And in MATLAB, if you wanted to write this in MATLAB notation, then what you would do is you would separate rows by semicolons. So as soon as the code sees a semicolon, it knows that 
you're moving to the next row if it's inside square bracket vector. Semicolons are also used to sur suppress outputs, but that happens outside the vector definition. So is that like a yeah, so typically the reason you need to know how to write it in both ways is because you'll start writing 2D vectors, so you'll have rows and columns. So you'll just use the semicolon to go to the next row. There's really no difference in these two in MATLAB. Um, you can do either. Okay, so let's think about a 2D array. So one that you're probably familiar with is the identity matrix in math, just for something easy, something like this. So this is typically called a matrix, um, but it doesn't have to. You could just store your data in two dimensions. Maybe column one is feet, column two is seconds, column three is velocity, whatever. You can just keep track of storing anything in any number of ways. And so to define this in MATLAB, you're going to open the you're going to open the the array. You're going to write in the first row and either separate by spaces or commas, and then you're going to move to the second row with a semicolon and then write in the next one, etc. until you get all four rows in. And I'll show you this on MATLAB too. So these two make sense because if you display 1D arrays or 2D arrays to the screen, you see everything, right? It's really easy to tell where everything is. However, MATLAB allows you to store multi-D arrays. And this isn't something that's just like some weird thing that only like the biggest and best researchers use, like use all them all the time, you use it. And um, just know that you can define storage of your data in three dimensions with any amount of data in each of the three dimensions, but you can also do 40 and you can't even really think of like where that data is because there's no spatial 4D, right? But you can. Um, it's just a matter of where, how you're accessing and where you're storing. It just tells it where, where to go. So what we're going to look at in MATLAB today is a few different things. And I'm going to write out the categories I'm going to cover. And hopefully you can kind of fill in your notes as I show you in MATLAB. So I'm going to show you how to define arrays because there's a couple shorthand from what I just showed you that's pretty convenient. I'm going to show you different ways that you can what I call manipulate arrays. <laughs> so that would be like multiplication, um, using functions, um, adding, transposing, anything like that. And then we're going to talk about accessing elements of an array. So let's say you have this huge array that stores all this data but you only need columns column 25, right? How would you just pull out just that the information that you need? And then we're going to talk maybe about memory allocation. And I'm probably not going to come back. Um, and if I have time, I'll do celerase too. And I'm not going to come back to the dot cam. I'm just going to do it over here. So most of this I'm probably going to do in the command window, but I might open up an M file if I want you to kind of keep track of some of this stuff. So let's just start by doing the three vectors so you can kind of see it, what it looks like. So um, if you set up the row vector with spaces, when you enter it in, it will print it out as a vector without the square brackets. It's just going to show the data if you see that. If I add in commas, you'll see that it's exactly the same. And arrays are particularly the reason why you want to suppress because we're going to have arrays that are like the one, the one lab, like lab seven. If you read in all the data, it's like 4,000 by like 3 million. It's like a huge amount of data. Do you know what I mean? So you cannot print it to the screen. You got to be selective. 
I, I exaggerated that a lot. It's not a million, but I think it's thousands, thousands of, of rows, hundreds of columns. Um, so that are the, that's how you do the the one D array um, for the <coughs> column. This is how you would do it if you wanted to use the semicolon notation. I almost never do it this way because I don't. The semicolon just doesn't fit with my with my style up on the keyboard. So what I do is I typically just type it out with spaces, and then I use the single quote, which is a transpose function, and it will automatically define, transpose, and then send it to D all at once. And it's a much cleaner way, in my opinion, of defining. I think the semicolons are really clunky. Um, if you want to do the full matrix, you're just going to put in your row and then add um, the semicolon to move to the next row. And I'll show you just what this looks like so that you can see that it does show you the dimensionality of the array. It'll put it in the proper rows and columns for that. And uh, I won't do a multi-D um, array right now. You'll do that in your um, pre-lab, but you'll notice that once you go one dimension forward, you can't look at it all at once. So it's going to show you slices of the, of the array, and it's really big. So it'll just print several slices. So if I had one more dimension, it would just print like 10 of these 4 by 4s for example. A couple of shorthand that are really useful is the colon <coughs> operator. So the colon operator allows you to create an array that is filled um, um, with patterns. So let's say that you needed to set up an X array for some data that started at 1, ended at 100, and had a number at every one iteration. So the shorthand for that would be 1 is where you're telling it to start, 100 <coughs> is where you're telling it to end, and then the colon just means fill in every one in between. So one is always the default step. And it's going to print pretty messy because it can't fit on one line. So it's going to just show you what column it's printing. If you, um, if you add a third value in between the um, two colons, then you can specify how the frequency that you would like repeated. So 1 colon 1 colon 100 is going to do the same thing I just did, but if I change this to 2, it's going to skip every 2. Start at 1, skip every 2 until it gets to the last one, and it doesn't get to 100, so it just skips 100. Uh, so that's really useful, and the thing that's nice about the colon operator is that it's the only way that you don't need square brackets. So the notation with the colon operator assumes an array, so you can leave out the square brackets. However, you can also include them. So when you're kind of early in like figuring out syntax, sometimes it's a good habit to always include square brackets for every array just to kind of get it in your brain a little bit better. There's two functions that are really useful um, that we're going to use all the time for preallocation. The first one <coughs> is the ones function. Um, that creates an array filled with ones and it is the size of the dimensions that you input into it. So this made an array that's a 3x3. Three three. The reason it's useful is that <coughs> if you're creating something that has that you're going to fill in later, if you pre-allocate it first, it significantly speeds up your calculations and, and um, uh, by allocating memory towards it. Uh, we don't get into that too much, but even when you move on to 303 and the resulting classes, if you don't start getting into the habit, your code can be up to like 10, 10 to 100 times slower if you don't pre-allocate. So we're going to talk about that and start getting that into our habits as well. There's a similar function called zeros, fills it with zeros. Depending on whether you're summing or multiplying or what you're doing, one of them will be preferable. Um, one tip is that if you just put in one number to the zeros or the ones function, 
it will automatically create a square matrix of that number. So here I just put in a four and it created a four by four. One thing that you should not do that a lot of people do, and I'll remind you this later when you start making this mistake, is people use the colon operator. Does anyone have any idea of what the colon operator would do? Yeah, it's going to create, yeah, exactly. It's going to create an array that has dimensions 1 by 2 by 3 by 4 by 5 by 6 by 7 by 8 by 9 by 10. So usually you'll get a memory error um, problem, but it just creates the dimensions of that array I put in. If that doesn't make sense, just think about it a little bit more. But what a lot of people do is because we'll create an array that's like 1 by 100, so people will do 1 colon 100. And so you get an, an error that says that you've exceeded the allowable memory for any single array. Okay, let's move on to manipulating arrays. So let's start with scalar multiplication. If you want to multiply every element of an array by a scalar, like 2, you just do normal, um, normal multiplication in front of the variable. So that's going to multiply 2 by each element. A lot of times what we do in this class is we start um, setting up arrays and everything's stored in a, in a single place. And like for this, for example, I have an array called v2 that has, has these three numbers and v that has these three numbers. And what I want to do is multiply the first element of the first one by the first element of the second one. The first element of the second second element of the first one times the second element of the second one, etc. So almost exclusively, with the exception of when we do linear algebra, anytime you're multiplying two arrays, you will need to use the dot operator. We're going to talk about the dot operator all the time. The dot operator is element by element multiplication, or if you're doing division, or if you're doing powers. So anytime you're multiplying two arrays by each other, dividing or doing a power, you need to make sure that you're using the dot operator. And so let's say I wanted to square every element of v. So I have v, I wanted to square each element. If I do v squared, I'm going to get an error because what it's going to try to do is matrix algebra, which is what MATLAB is defaulted to. What I want it to do is just take every element and square it. So I need to use the dot in order to show that I'm just taking each element and squaring them individually. Um, and you'll start to see this once you start applying it. Addition, on the other, t on the other hand, so if I have v and v2, I have, let's say I just wanted to add those elements together, that one you don't need the dot for. So if I want to take 4, 4 and 2 and add them, 10 and 5 and add them, and 14 and 7 and add them, I can just use the addition sign. The addition sign and the subtraction sign do not require dots. That's because addition and subtraction are the same whether they're scalars or um, vectors. So here I just added 2 to the vector v, and you can see that it just added 2 to each element of v. Do you add a dot? I don't know. To be honest, with a lot of these syntax things, MATLAB ends up uh, changing stuff like this. Yeah, so it doesn't allow the dot in front of um, the plus sign. Any other questions about that? Um, the other thing with vectors is that you're allowed to use any functions on vectors. So I have my array v, and if I wanted to take the cosine of every element, I just, I just input that array into the function cosine. And so that is just going to go through and to calculate element by element. And so functions are set up to do array manipulation by default. So you don't have to do anything special. So that would be for any trig function, <laughs> exponentials, anything that you need to do. If you need to do it to a big data set, you can do it all at once like that. Um, a couple useful functions for arrays. There's two that are really nice. The first is length. Length will just count the number um, of elements in an array. If it's a 2D array, it will actually count the number in each row. 
so it's not as useful, but a lot of the stuff we were doing uh, will just be a 1D array. So if you want to be able to tell how many elements, you'll want to use length. The other useful function is size, and size tells you the dimensions of the array. So it sounds like they would both be fine, but a lot of times one of them is more useful than the other um, because the output of size is actually another array. So it's an array that holds one and two. So if I saved the output of size to an array SC, if I wanted to know how many elements, I would actually have to access just the second element of SC, which I'll show you in a second. So it's a little bit more steps to get to length. But length and size, you'll practice both of those in the pre-lab. I'm going to move on to accessing now, which I just kind of did a little bit, but let's, um, let's look at accessing now. Okay, so let's say I have an array D or an array V, they'll both act the same, a 1D array. If you want to access elements of the array, you use the parentheses as your syntax. So in order to say that you're accessing specific elements, you open the parentheses. And that is why, for all of you, lots of you have asked this, that is why parentheses are not allowed for multiplication. It's because the parentheses is reserved for array mm -hmm. accessing. But if I type in 1, it's going to pull out only the first element of V. If I put 2, it'll take the second. But what's also useful is you can pull out stretches of an array. So this says I want to pull out the first through the second element of V. So sometimes that's useful to just grab onto different pieces. Um, let's look at a 2D array now. So A has rows and columns. <coughs> so you can use single index notation on 2D arrays. So I can just pick one and it will pick the first one. I can pick five and it will pick the fifth one, but it's hard to remember how it's counting. And it's counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's how it's counting, but that's super obnoxious. So when you're working in your arrays lab, I do not encourage you to use the one um, coordinate accessing notation. Instead, use the two, which says that the first element will give you the row that you would like to access, and the second gives you the column. So this is going to go to row one, column one, and give me that element. So it's just went mm -hmm. one, comma, one. Uh, let me create a different array that has a lot of different values. This one? Okay. So here is an array B. So if I access 2, comma, 3, um, that's going to go to the second row and the third column. So that's useful a lot when we start grabbing individual elements inside loops. But what we often do as well is we have all of our data in a single variable, but we only want to access a column of the full array. So here's where you use the colon operator again. So let's say we wanted to take the second column of the vector. So the colon operator says all. That's the way you want to remember it. Colon means all. So I want all the rows because I'm trying to get a column. And then the second column. So that should give me 7, 5, 1, right? Because I'm grabbing all the rows but of the second column, 7, 5, 1. If you want to grab a row, you're going to put the colon in the second index. So let's say we want to take the last row, so that's 3. We'll do 3, comma, colon. And here you can see that 3, comma, colon is going to give the last row of the B array. So again, I'm taking the third row and all the columns in that row. And you don't need to put only a, a, colon, a colon there. You can also say 1 to 10, like just take 
some of the columns or some of the rows. So you can use the colon operator the same as we did when we defined arrays. It works exactly the same. So the colon operator is really important for both defining and accessing. So keep practicing that until it starts making sense for you. And along that same line, you can replace values in an array by accessing the value that you want to replace. So for example, let's say I want to replace second row, second column with a zero. You just pull out the one that you want to access, set it equal to the new value you want it to have. And so here you can see that it used to have a five there and now it has a zero there. You can replace whole columns and whole rows as well. And then the last thing is that you can add or remove columns and rows. So let's say we wanted to add a row to B. I'm going to call out the fourth row and I want to put all zeros on the fourth row. So I'm just gonna call out the fourth row and set all the values to zero and now it has a fourth row there. You can also set this equal to an array if you want each element of the row to be different. And it just needs to have the right match for size. Let's say I want to go back and remove that row. To remove a row, you just open and close the square bracket. And that will take away that row or take away that element. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit about cell arrays. You're going to start using them in lab two. Cell arrays are arrays that allow you to mix data types within the array. So one element could have a string and one element could have a number. We rarely use them in that way, but we use them for strings. So let's say that I had an array that's, that stored three students scores. So these are three different students and I stored each student score in a different element of the array. And I wanted to have another array that stored their names in the same element location so that I could match their names with their scores. To do that I would use a cell array which means I use curly brackets. And then in the first element, I would put the full name and I would just put it in as a string. And then I would list the other two separated by commas. And you do need to use commas for cell arrays. Um, it's the only way, I don't know actually, you might not need to. Should we try it? <coughs> You don't. Okay. Spaces or commas just like regular arrays and that way if I wanted to access, I, I knew that the second student had the score and I wanted to know which student that was, I would just type in the name and then for cells if you want to access you still have to use curly brackets. You can't use parentheses for cells pretty much for anything. And then I access two and it would show me the name of just held in the second element. And so a lot of people when they start doing these, this naming convention or this storing convention where you have two different arrays that are totally separate, totally different variable names, and they often think, well, how does MATLAB know that they're the same? How does it know element one and element one in each one match? And the answer is it doesn't. MATLAB doesn't know anything, but you know that because you programmed it, you know, and that's good enough. The programmer knows where everything was stored, and that's that's the way the program was written. So you're going to do this in lab two with storing the names of some of the data that you're using so that when you find a result, you can print the name of that result and the value rather than just the value. Um, so cell arrays are exclusively used for holding um, character strings in an array. So let me show you <coughs> why you don't want to use just a regular, I'm going to scroll up so I don't have to retype it. So let me go back up to here. I'm going to make a regular array 
and I'm going to rename it names2. So I didn't make it a cell array, I'm just making it a regular array. What happens is it just puts them all together. Every character is a different element in the array. So if I do names2 and try to access the second element, it's not going to give me Nick, it's just going to give me the second letter. So character strings allow you to put characters together in different elements of an array. And so it's, ex it's basically necessary to use um, for any strings. Um, from, as far as memory allocation, it's the last thing on the list. Um, anytime you're going to fill in an array with numbers, the first step that you would want to do if you're not filling them in all at once, like here, I'm filling in an array and I'm putting in all the numbers at once. But let's say that I was going to fill them in one by one. Um, like I was going to put in the fourth element and then I was going to put in a fifth element. I was going to just add on to an array one at a time. If you're going to do that, you want to start off by pre-allocating your array as the size that you want it to be. So you know eventually you're going to make an array that has 10 elements, but you're going to fill them in one at a time. Before you fill them in, you need to pre-allocate location in memory for it to create that array. And then, so V is now a bunch of zeros, and then go in and one by one add in all of the values to that. We're, we're going to do this with loops mainly, but if you're doing it in any other way, you're all going to kind of take on your own. Make sure that you're doing that, okay? And we'll talk about memory allocation again when we get to loops. Before you pack up, we still have two minutes so that I can hear questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Why do you have to pre-allocate So if you don't pre-allocate, what MATLAB does is every time you add on to the array, it actually finds a new place in memory. So first it finds three spots, and then the next time you add on, it goes and finds four spots, but those three spots are still used until you restart the program. It makes it faster, and eventually when you start doing big problems, it makes it the only way, because you don't have enough memory to do it that way. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.